Cavalcade of America, starring John Payne in Secret Operation, presented by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> Operation starring John Payne as Dr. John Erdman on the DuPont Cavalcade of America. It was a bad year and a bad month. June 1893. It was a time of worldwide trouble, of mounting crisis. In the United States of America, Congress nervously debated the issue of sound currency. And in Washington, both parties conceded that the new president was about all that stood between the country and national disaster. But at Bellevue Hospital, Surgeon John F. Erdman merely turned on a water tap and commenced to scrub his hands. Dr. Erdman was about to examine a patient. He had no thought for anything else. Just a second, I'll be right with you. Door's open, come in. Oh, what is it, nurse? Dr. Bryant wants to see you right away, Doctor. What about? He didn't say, Doctor, only that it was important. I see. Will you tell Dr. Bryant that I'm scrubbing? He asked that you come immediately. He made a point of it, Doctor. Tell him I have a patient waiting, Miss Barry. My instructions are to bring you at once, right now, Dr. Erdman. Those are my instructions. All right, all right. Tell Dr. Bryant I'll be there directly. Immediately, Doctor. It's urgent. <laughs> Dr. Erdman, I'm going to perform a critical operation. I want you to assist me. All right. But where's the fire? What sort of an operation? If you have no objection, I'll discuss it with you another time. Another time? You pull me out of... All right. Whatever you say, Doctor. When is the operation to be? The date is not definite. Oh? Well, where is it to be? That will be decided. Well, who's the patient? <laughs> You're in a rather talkative mood, aren't you, Dr. Bryant? I'm sorry. I can't give you more information. You still live in that place on West 34th Street? Yes, yeah, same place. A Dr. O'Reilly will call for you. May I suggest that you make no engagements for the evening of June 30th? You know something, Dr. Bryant? Most normal people have a normal amount of curiosity. Don't encourage it, Dr. Erdman. As you wish, sir. And I will take it as a personal favor if you speak to no one about this meeting. Yes, Doctor. I can't tell you how glad I am to know that you'll be with us. Don't forget, Dr. O'Reilly will call for you. Mrs. Johnson, has there been anyone for me? I've been here in your rooms working all day, Dr. Erdman, and as I've told you twice, there's not been anyone calling on you. This is June 30th, isn't it? All day. Are you quite sure there was no one... Quite sure, Dr. Erdman. That's funny. Well, when he does call, his name will be O'Reilly. Uh, then you'll be going away, Doctor? I didn't say that, Mrs. Johnson. Well, you keep sticking your head out of that window, you'll go away by falling out. As soon as he comes, please call him, show him right up. You haven't heard a word I said. Hmm? I uh, beg your pardon. Oh, well, all right. I'll show the gentleman up, Dr. Erdman, and may his conversation with you be more satisfactory than mine. <laughs> gentleman here to see you, Dr. Erdman. Uh, the gentleman. Oh, won't you please come in, sir? Thank you. Uh, that will be all, Mrs. Johnson. Dr. Bryant has told me a good deal about you, Dr. Erdman. You have the advantage over me, sir. Dr. Bryant has told me nothing about you. There's a reason for that, Doctor. All right, excuse it. Uh, may I offer you something? No, there won't be time. Look, I'm not a child. This is absurd. I, I suggest that you throw a few things into a suitcase. May I ask where we are going, Dr. O'Reilly? To the battery. And may I ask what happens after we reach the battery? Why don't we see, then? 
I must say, this is the strangest piece of business. It may I... get even stranger. What's the best way of reaching the battery from here? Well, the best way is by handsome cab. The quickest way is in the steam elevator. We'll take the steam elevator. Dr. O'Reilly, may I ask... Yes, you... Dr. Erdman. Uh, nothing. Nothing at all. We'll take the steam elevator. <laughs> Dr. Erdman, I understand you do a considerable amount of surgery. I do nothing else. Dr. Bryant speaks well of you. Coming from Joseph D. Bryant, that's very high praise. Thank you. I suppose you've had quite a bit of cancer work. Oh, now I understand. I'm to assist Dr. Bryant in a cancer operation. That is correct. A carcinoma of the left upper jaw. Hmm. Now, what hospital, Dr. Riley? No hospital. In a private home? No. I am to assist Dr. Bryant in a cancer operation. Carcinoma, the left upper jaw. In no hospital, in no house, and presumably upon no patient. I understand your irritation, Dr. Erdman. Believe me, this secrecy is absolutely necessary. Please have confidence in me a little longer. <laughs> You and the other gentlemen will step down into the dinghy. I'll row you off the yacht, Major. Have the others come aboard yet? Not yet, Major. Thank you. F you, Dr. Erdman. Thank you, sir. Careful on the ladder, please. She's wet and slippery. That's it. You better hold your hats, gentlemen. She's blowing up a bit. That's where we're going, Doctor. That yacht out there. Oh... N-E-I-D-A, Oneida. Quite a substantial vessel. Who owns it? Commodore E.C. Benedict. Then Commodore Benedict is our patient. No, Dr. Erdman. I believe Commodore Benedict to be in good health. I see. I shan't ask any more questions. Good. But I'll be able to answer some of them once we're on board. <laughs> operation will be performed right here in the ship's salon. Well, I'd say you've got enough hospital equipment here for a battleship. Nothing has been omitted. Mm-hmm. I suppose we sit down and wait for Dr. Bryant and the others. Yes, of course, Major. How many others? Dr. Hasbrook, a dentist, will extract the teeth to give free access to the upper jaw. Dr. E.G. Janeway. Janeway? You know him? The whole world knows him. Dr. Janeway will watch the patient's pulse and general condition. I shall administer the anesthetic. Dr. Bryant will operate, assisted by you and Dr. William Keene of Philadelphia. Bryant, Janeway, O'Reilly, Keene, Hasbrook, and myself. Six. Quite a cargo. Yes. And uh, a patient. And the patient. Yes, thank you. I suppose we wait for Dr. Bryant and the others. Dr. Bryant will explain. <laughs> Gentlemen, that is the entire picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Edmund, I believe you have a question. Seems to me you're entitled to one. Uh, no, sir. I understand now the reason for all the secrecy. By whom was the cancer discovered? By Major O'Reilly. When was that, Major? Twelve days ago, Doctor. I found a rough place in the mouth. I cut away a fragment of tissue and, without disclosing the identity of the patient... I asked for an immediate biopsy. Dr. O'Reilly called me when the report of malignancy was made. No time has been lost, then. Exactly, Dr. Edmund, no time has been lost. We have our patient to thank for that. It was his decision. I would like to add something. You all understand the necessity for secrecy. Not only now, but... but... even after. It must not be known that there was an operation. There must be no telltale scar... We'll retract the cheek, remove the teeth, and perform the entire operation within the mouth itself. The patient will have to speak. Correct. Now, speech isn't possible with a good portion of the jaw missing. Dr. Casson Gibson will take a cast and make an artificial jaw of vulcanized rubber. If all goes well, no one will be able to detect the difference. 
And uh, if all doesn't go well? If all doesn't go well, Dr. Edmund, the captain might just as well run us on a rock so we can all drown. Glad to have you, sir. Well, I can't say I'm terribly anxious to join you. Not this time. Yes, sir. May I give you a hand, sir? No, I'm fat and 56. But I guess I can still board the Oneida by myself. <laughs> Dr. Bryant and Major O'Reilly arrived? Yes, sir. And all the other gentlemen. They're in the salon, sir. Ah, fine evening. Wonderfully cool on the river. Yes, sir. This door, sir? Thank you. Major. Ah, oh, we've been expecting you, sir. <laughs> Wouldn't be much of a party without me. <laughs> How are you, Dr. Bryant? Very well, thank you, sir. May I present my colleagues? Mm, by all means. Dr. Janeway, Dr. Keene, Dr. Hasbrook, and Dr. Erdman. Gentlemen, our patient, the President of the United States, Mr. Grover Cleveland. Listening to Secret Operation, starring John Payne as Dr. Erdman on the Cavalcade of America, presented by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. On July 1st, 1893, Four months after the second inauguration of President Grover Cleveland, the Yacht Oneida steamed up the East River into Long Island Sound toward the waters of New London, Connecticut. It was a voyage as fateful as any ever made in the history of the United States. For 1893 was a year of mounting crisis, and the American people depended on their president for the solution. A special session of Congress had been called. But that president, Grover Cleveland, was a man threatened by death, threatened by cancer, the great killer. Gentlemen, I have no desire to add to your responsibilities. It would have been more sensible to perform the operation in the hospital or in the White House. But if it were known that the president was suffering from a cancer of the jaw in a period of crisis like this one... The result would be unmitigated disaster. We understand, sir. Fine. Now, uh, where do you want me, Dr. Erdman? In this chair, Mr. President. Hmm. That's my operating table, eh? Yes, sir. Rather unusual, isn't it, doing an operation like this in a chair? You'll be strapped to the mast, sir. There's less danger of swallowing blood this way. Uh, I see. Now, Miss Do. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, I've called a special session of Congress for August 7th, 37 days from now. I've got to be there. And you've got to see to it. All right, gentlemen. Your patience ready. Thank you, sir. Dr. Janeway? The pulse rate is 90. Heart sounds are normal. Thank you. I think we're ready for the anesthesia. See it, Erdman? Yes, Dr. Bryan. The area extends from the molars almost to the median line and encroaches slightly, slightly on the soft palate. We'll take a look. Cheek retractor, please. Janeway pulse? Pulse 88. Respiration normal. How much hemorrhage, Erdman? Less than six ounces. Good. Hot water, please. Pulse 
Pulse 84. Hemorrhage extremely slight. Respiration normal. Well, that's about it. For now, Dr. Erdman and Dr. Keene will take turns watching the president. I think the rest of us can go on deck and start breathing again. Yes? Steward, sir. Come in. Dr. Erdman, I took the liberty, sir. I thought you might like some hot coffee. Oh, yes, I most certainly would. That's mighty thoughtful of you. Yes, sir. Will the president live, Dr. Erdman? I hope so. But you don't know. No one can know. I'll not talk about it to any man alive. Dr. Erdman, but the president, well, he's been aboard the Oneida many times. He's an old friend. Was it? Yes. Cancer. Oh, gosh. What's your name? Oh, uh, Willis, sir. Then listen to me, Willis. It's not hopeless. No cancer is ever hopeless when you catch it early. And we caught this one early. If you want to pray, go to your cabin and pray that we caught it early enough, and that we got it all, and that, well, just pray, Willis. Uh, oh, I wouldn't try to speak, Mr. Cleveland. Even though you've had a few hours rest since the operation, it isn't advisable. Uh, here. Here's a pad and a pencil. Oh. What did we do to you? Yes. You're minus two left bicuspid teeth, Mr. Cleveland. Your entire left upper jaw has been removed. Also a small portion of the soft palate. Mm. Fortunately, there was no sign that the structure around the eye had been attacked. Washington. Did you say Washington? Uh-huh. Oh, I believe Dr. Erdman has a message from Colonel Lamont. Yes, sir. Colonel Lamont has received several dispatches relating to the silver question, but nothing else. To the best of his knowledge, Washington doesn't know why you're on the Oneida or what has just taken place. Erdman? No one must know. We all understand, Mr. President. I can vouch for the medical man. This operation will remain a secret. Congress, August 7th. Mr. Cleveland, I have to tell you now, a second operation may be necessary. If there is any suspicious-looking tissue remaining, it will have to be removed. August 7th. Mr. President, whether the United States adopts a sound currency is not my affair. My concern is the life of the President of the United States. August 7th. Very well, sir. Second operation or not, you will appear before Congress August 7th. God willing. Yes, Mr. Cleveland, God willing. <laughs> Gentlemen, I have good news for you. The President of the United States is sitting up. I think we can all relax. Well, <laughs> precisely the way I feel, Dr. Erdman. <laughs> Dr. Bryant, the two longest days of my life. And it isn't over, Major. That's the unnerving part of it. It isn't over until we know there's not a single trace of cancerous tissue left in Mr. Cleveland's mouth. When will you know? Perhaps by next week, at least for the present. Shall we all remain on board? No, that won't be necessary, Dr. Janeway. If Dr. Keene and Dr. Erdman will remain with the patient until Independence Day, I'll be able to accompany him to Buzzards Bay. I hate to be a bore, but not a word of what's happened on the Oneida must leak out. That's a shame. 
Why do you say that, Erdman? Because if the president lives, it'll be because Mr. Cleveland didn't wait, because the cancer was treated immediately upon detection. I can't think of anything more important to tell the world. Someday, perhaps, the story will be told. Until then, it must remain an absolute secret. Good night, gentlemen. On July 4th, 1883, the Yacht Oneida carried President Grover Cleveland to Buzzards Bay and Gray Gables. On the 15th day of July, Dr. Joseph Bryant made another examination. There are some suspicious-looking granulations, Mr. Cleveland. We'll try burning them out. The second operation on the president was performed on July 17th. Dr. Casson Gibson, a prosthetic dentist from New York City, took an impression of President Cleveland's jaw and made a vulcanized rubber substitute for the section removed. Thank goodness. I'll be able to talk again. Convalescence was rapid. But so was rumor. Man here to see you, Dr. Erdman. There is? Uh, that man over there. Sorry. I won't see any patients today. Man isn't a patient. That's right, Dr. Erdman. I'm a newspaper reporter. Oh? They tell me it's an interesting line of work. Don't believe it. Surgery is much more interesting. Uh, Dr. Erdman, did you operate on President Cleveland? I did not. Did Dr. Bryant operate on President Cleveland? Why not ask Dr. Bryant? Was the president operated on? Why not ask the president? <laughs> Dr. Edmund, do you know Major O'Reilly? No. You sure? I've told you so. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Dr. Edmund. Good afternoon, Mrs. Johnson. Good afternoon. Uh, take good care of the doctor. He looks a little peaked to me. The fragile type. I will. So you don't know Major O'Reilly. Mrs. Johnson, you suffer from a most malignant curiosity. You never even heard of Major O'Reilly, hmm? I know a Dr. O'Reilly. Oh, you. For a minute, I thought that maybe you'd be in the news. I always wanted to know someone who'd be in the news. Well, maybe you will someday. I see where President Cleveland made a speech to Congress. Really? Well, what kind of a speech? Oh, something about keeping the country stable and repealing the Silver Act. Paper says the president spoke in good, clear voice. Well, why shouldn't he? Dr. Ehrman, you don't read the newspapers, do you? Why, they've been saying the president has a cold, a terrible cold. Well, that's a shame. The president ought to watch his health. <laughs> Grover Cleveland finished his term as president during four of the most turbulent years of the last century. He retired from office in 1897, universally respected and honored as one of America's great presidents. He lived until 1907, 15 years after his secret operation. And this is why the story of his operation should not only be told, but emphasized. For President Cleveland did not die of cancer. The operation was entirely successful. And may this knowledge be a comfort to millions of American citizens and to all people everywhere. We triumph over cancer when we do not wait. Our star, John Payne, will return in just a moment with a very interesting guest. Now, our star, John Payne. Thank you. In tonight's cavalcade, I played the part of Dr. John Erdman. Right here on the stage with me is the real Dr. Erdman, 85 years young, and acknowledged by the medical profession to be one of America's great surgeons. Dr. Erdman? Thank you. Mr. Payne, it was very interesting to relive these exciting moments again. 
How did you feel when you learned you were going to operate on President Cleveland? Nervous, like I do right now. <laughs> How about the president? Was he nervous too? Not at all. Mr. Cleveland was the kind of man who thought carefully before making a decision, and once he made it, stop worrying. He was a man of great courage and patriotism. He was a man you had to admire. And he didn't die of cancer? No. And, Mr. Payne, I think that the people of the United States can learn a lesson from this story of President Cleveland tonight. Cancer does not have to be fatal. Catch it quickly and act quickly. Thank you, Dr. Erdman. <laughs> Tonight's cavalcade play, Secret Operation, was written by Morton Wishingrad and directed by Jack Zoller. Music was composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Bryant. Featured in tonight's cast were House Jameson as Dr. Bryant, Les Damison as Dr. O'Reilly, and James Goss as President Cleveland. John Payne may soon be seen starring in The Crooked Way, a Benedict Bogus United Artist production photographed by John Alton on DuPont Superior II motion picture film. Next week, Cavalcade will present the lovely star of stage and screen, Madeline Carroll, who is currently appearing in the Broadway success Goodbye, My Fancy. Miss Carroll will be heard in a thrilling and romantic Cavalcade play, The Queen's Handmaid. Ladies and gentlemen, millions of our fellow human beings in Europe are suffering from malnutrition. CARE guarantees delivery of a relief package of food and clothing to 12 European countries. Get in touch with CARE and help its needed work. This is Ted Pearson speaking. Cavalcade of America comes to you each week from the stage of the Long Anchor Theater on Broadway in New York and is presented by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.